History tells us that the winters of 1778, when Washington made camp at Valley Forge, was the worst winter ever. We read stories of half-naked soldiers in tattered uniforms, with blankets that are half-worn through, huddled around fires, starving and trying to stay warm. What's interesting to note is that two years later, in 1780, Baron Johann de Kelb, a German soldier who served as a major general in the Continental Army, said this, Those who have only been in Valley Forge and Middlebrook during these last two winters, but have not tasted the cruelties of this one, know not what it is to suffer. So if the winters of 1780 in Morristown were so much worse, why is Valley Forge taught to be such a great struggle of survival. No one actually celebrated anything during the time of the Revolutionary War. It was around the early 19th century when writers of the time looked back to the Revolutionary War to try and find inspiration to spark a new flame of patriotism in support of the War of 1812. The War of 1812, for those of you who don't know, was a 32-month war between the United States and the British Empire. But that still doesn't answer the question of why Valley Forge is hailed the time of suffering and challenge of the Revolutionary War. Well, if you've studied American history, then you probably already know why. But let's take a quick look, and if you don't know, then it will become obvious. There's nothing ideal about any of the winter encampments. The camps were constructed by cutting down hundreds of acres of trees to construct upwards of 2,000 log huts. These huts had a door on one end, 12 bunks in the middle, and a fireplace at the other end. The gaps between the logs were filled with mud to keep the cold out. But they were still cold. The winter at Valley Forge was cold, but it was a fairly normal winter. The Continental soldiers had provisions much like what they received on routine basis. Many survived on hardtack, which is nothing more than flour and water mixed into something like a really thick saltine cracker. There were soldiers that lacked adequate clothes, which also caused some suffering. But most of the soldiers had proper uniforms and equipment. The biggest impact was from a former member of the Prussian general staff, Baron Frederick Wilhelm von Steuben. Steuben was recruited by Benjamin Franklin to help design and implement training programs for the Continental Army. Steuben also improved sanitization within the camps. Because of his influence, the Continental Army emerged from the winter of Valley Forge as a superior fighting force than the one that arrived several months before. To add to that encouragement to an already morally bolstered fighting force, the army announced on May 6th of 1778 that the French would join in the war as allies of the Continental Army. Fast forward two years to the winters at Morristown. The war pretty much came to a standstill as the most harsh winter in recorded history settled in. You want to talk about hell freezing over? This was the only time in recorded history that all of the saltwater harbors and inlets of the Atlantic coastal plain from North Carolina on up froze over and stayed frozen for over a month. Tell me, when was the last time you saw coastal waters, salt water in the United States freeze over? In Philadelphia, the Daily High broke the freezing mark only once during the entire month of January. Timothy Matlack, the scribe of the official copy of the Declaration of Independence, stated that the ink in his pen froze while sitting in his parlor at four in the afternoon while sitting five feet from his fire. George Washington said, For a fortnight past, the troops, both officers and men, have been almost perishing for want. January 18th of 1780. The snow was 12 feet deep or more across the roads. No supplies could get in and no one could get out. Private Joseph Plum Martin stated, I do solemnly declare that I did not 
put a single morsel of victuals into my mouth for four days and as many nights, except a little black birch bark, which I gnawed off a stick of wood, if that can be called victuals at all. I saw several of the men roast their old shoes and eat them, and I was afterwards informed by one of the officer's waiters that some of the officers killed and ate a favorite little dog that belonged to one of them. Surviving through a winter is one thing, but a record-baking hellstorm of constant sub-freezing temperatures and no supplies, it was bound to happen. Private Martin later recalled that the men were now exacerbated beyond endurance. They could not stand it any longer. They so saw no alternative but to starve to death or give it all up and go home. Can you imagine the internal conflict? Suffering short of death to fight for your freedom. After all they'd been through up to this point, to give all that up was too much. But to starve and freeze to death was also too much. They didn't all stand fast. Several regiments formed up to protest. Several tried to leave. But you can't get very far trying to walk through 12 feet deep snow in the roads. There were protests throughout the rest of the winter of 1780. So if you look at these two winters of 1778 and 1780, you can easily see why Valley Forge is so romanticized. The troops suffered in relative silence compared to Morristown. They trained hard and emerged a better army, plus the French allied with the Continental Army. There was just more to celebrate coming out of Valley Forge winter. Suffice it to say, every winter was hard for the soldiers of the Colonial Army. Supplies were always sparse. The soldiers' huts were cold, and the soldiers did not have the greatest cold weather gear. But why do we care? Why is this important? Because, my friends, you and I, we are the Continental Army. We are the United States unorganized militia. This is our time. These are our rights. If our forefathers can survive the winters of Valley Forge and Morristown and lay down their lives to secure our freedom, then we can survive a few hours of winter cold to stand at our nation's capitals. We can show up at legislative hearings to testify and show our support for the freedoms that they fought and died for. The only one who can take these rights away is God himself. If you don't believe in God, then only death can take these rights away. They do not belong to the government to legislate or take away. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed.